It is October 22nd, 2022, and you are listening to the Sabbath teaching service from Ephraim's Light Assembly. My name is Doris Smith, the pastor's wife and assistant. We are in a new year of God's calendar. Today we continue our study of the book of Genesis. The Bible portion we are studying today is Noah, the life and times of Noah. We recommend that you pause the presentation and read Genesis 6-9 to Genesis 11-32 so that this teaching will be more meaningful to you. This is the story of a new beginning, but man is already in trouble. Follow this teaching and discover why. And now with 30 years of Bible teaching, pastoring, evangelism, and leading deliverance teams and prayer groups is Pastor Frank Smith, founder and senior pastor of Ephraim's Light Assembly with today's powerful teaching, Game Over. It is pleasing to God that we're all here to study this week's portion of Scripture from Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 to Genesis chapter 11, verse 32. This week we're studying two major events in Scripture, the Great Flood and the dispersion brought about through the Tower of Babel. Sin was the cause of them both. However, the sins that caused the flood were sins against the commandments of God, but the Tower of Babel was a war directly against God. In this teaching, we're going to get an understanding of the times and the people involved in these tragedies and how they apply to us today. We need to set something straight in the beginning. The belief that human beings and their attitudes in biblical times were different than today is simply not true. Yeshua confirms this in Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. If you think that things are different now just because of technology and education, you're wrong. The enemy of man and God is still convincing man that God is far away, unconcerned about human activities on earth, and life is going on as always. God has not changed any of his principles, my friends. He's not changed them since the foundation of the earth, and the enemy has not changed his way of deceiving mankind, so nothing's different. We are still frail humans, even the greatest of us. We're a people who have to learn to overcome the world created by the prince and power of the air, one of corruption and wickedness. Today, we talk about Noah and the times in which he lived. And here are some quick facts about that time. The people were blind to the righteousness of God, blind right up to the point of their own destruction. They were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. They were not focused on God or on teshuva, which is turning back to the ways of God. Yeshua said in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. So this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. There was great wickedness and evilness in the world in Noah's day. God saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every scheme of man's mind, every thought that he had was of nothing but evil all the time. See, I told you nothing's changed. All these things are present and polluting people's minds today. Check the headlines. Everything is against the laws of God. Man's thoughts are indeed constantly evil. Let me give you some of the things that people were doing in Noah's time. The hybridization of the species was going on. False religion that promoted idol worship was going on. Blaming and cursing God. Murder and murder through abortion was rampant and justified by man. Adultery and sexual immorality were common. 
Theft was thought of as the right to take other people's property without any honor or any regard to the person. Genesis 6.11, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with wickedness. Only ten generations from Adam and mankind was so corrupt, God had to destroy them. That is depravity. But think about this. It's happening at a faster pace in America at this time than it did in the time period from Adam to Noah. In Noah's day, it was so severe that unrighteousness affected even some of the angels. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. When mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, the watchers, angels, saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. Now, what we're seeing here is the first interaction of man with the spiritual world that God forbade because that contact opens portals between the physical world and the spiritual world in which wicked spirits transverse into this world. False spirits are always seeking to contact humans. They have no body. They want to enter a body. Alien encounters are a part of this. You see, we can only see a small portion, maybe about 3% of what is going on in the spiritual world, and God knows that the 97% we can't see is very harmful to us. In the days of Noah, evil men were trying to alter God's creation, and they still are at it today. Man is constantly messing with the genetic codes that God established, interweaving genetic codes in GMO foods and genetic slicing through DNA manipulation, playing God and creating new species that are in some cases half animal and half human, and affecting plant life. Scripture tells us interweaving through hybrids and crimea are a sickening violation of God's creation. In the past 150 years, men have become mockers and scoffers of God. Noah and Methuselah partnered in calling for repentance for 120 years without one convert. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-7. through 7. First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff living according to their own desires, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They willfully ignore this. Long ago the heavens and the earth were brought about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But by the same word, The present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. In the last five years before the flood, Noah built the ark, a physical warning to the people, but the people just became more wicked and more violent. In our day, it seems the more we try to end violence, the greater it becomes. Hamas is Hebrew for violence. The LGBTQ community mocks God by taking a symbol of God's covenant, the rainbow, and adopting it to their organization as if they represent something that God has ordained. They don't. Some people today falsely depend on God's grace to justify their habitual and deliberate sin mocking God. They totally destroy the meaning of grace. Therefore, God has made grace an important subject in the lessons of this portion of Scripture. In Hebrew, grace is shet, meaning favor, and it's more about action than belief. Grace is God fulfilling a covenant that he made even though we didn't uphold our end of the covenant. God is gracious with both grace and mercy, but they are void when there are egregious acts of sin against God. And this is what is so great about God. 
He is generous with both mercy and grace, but highly offended when our rebellion against him is intentional, offensive, and flagrant. So there are a lot of lessons for us to absorb from the life and times of Noah. Let's take a moment and go into some trivial things that run into deeper things. The spelling of Noah is the Hebrew letters noon hit. If you reverse it and make it hit noon, his name forms the Hebrew word for grace. So grace is not New Testament. It is first shown in the Bible in Genesis 6, verse 8. Grace is one of the attributes of God that first appears in Scripture in the life of Noah. Through grace, we see hidden glimpses of the Messiah. Messiah is the ark, the Savior, who carries us through the floodwaters of trials and tribulations. He paid the penalty of our sin so that we could have an opportunity to turn back to God. The application for us is to put faith into action. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Yeshua. Other versions say faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as we review the Torah scrolls, we find there are no anomalies in this portion of Scripture. There are, however, lots of symbols. If two Hebrew words have the same value, there is a deeper lesson to be learned. So as we go along, we're going to be finding deeper meanings to the Scripture by looking at other words that have the same value as the words Noah and grace. The value of both of these words using the gematria is 58. The noon has a value of 50, and the chet, a value of eight. At the sud level, we're going to be looking at other witnesses that reflect a deeper meaning of what we read in the literal. These witnesses come from Jubilees chapter 6 and 7, Enoch chapter 7, and the Haftorah portion, which is Isaiah chapter 54 verse 1 through Isaiah 55 verse 5. Let's start by looking at Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The godly fear that Noah experienced is defined as holy awe. It is his awe, his reference and respect of God that caused him to be obedient to build the ark that God gave him the plans for. It was righteousness by faith. But can you imagine the ridicule and mockery he had to endure to do it? So let's talk for a moment about righteousness by faith. It means that a person's actions are not driven by their own desires, but God's desires and in God's timing. It's being submissive to God, totally submissive. Noah acted on the will of God, abandoning his own personal desires. So this week's Bible portion begins with Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. Here is the history of Noah. In his generation, Noah was a man righteous and wholehearted. Noah walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and yes, it was corrupt, for all living things had corrupted their ways on the earth. Now, when we read this in the original Hebrew and in the Torah scroll, the word generations is there twice but it does not have the same meaning each time. The original Hebrew reads like this. These are the generations of Noah, a man righteous, blameless was he in his generations. With God walked Noah and begat Noah three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now what I have to give you can only be seen in the Hebrew. 
The first time generations is used, it is the word todot, meaning descendants. The second word that is translated as generations is bidoroth, a completely different connotation. The word birotha means characterized by quality, condition, class of men, dwelling place, or habitation. You see, dor, D-O-R, is the root word, and it means something living, revolving, or gyrating. It is the picture of what we now know as DNA or lineage, and it means that certain traits were living in Noah's lineage. Among those traits was righteousness. Ish Zadik Tamin Halakha. Ish is a man, Zadik a righteous man, complete. Tamin, completely walking with God. Halakha is God's word we live by as preserved by Judah. In Noah's being, he was still in the image of God. This trait was passed on to his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah, more than any man on the earth at that time of his generation, was walking exactly as God told him to live, including whom he would marry, and this is what preserved him and his lineage to be saved. Because Noah followed and obeyed God, he preserved and protected Noah's DNA from the hybrid DNA of the watchers or giants. These were the wicked angels who became filled with lust resulting in them crossbreeding with the women on the earth, and the result were giants that were wicked. People's sexual behavior became so depraved and so immoral that even the animals were influenced to cohabit outside their species. It's a pattern or principle of God to forbid any crossbreeding among the species. I take you to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. God forbids the mixing of wool and other fibers for clothing. God has a pure DNA in each species that is to be protected against contamination. And this is because each has its God-given purpose and God opposes man tinkering with it for any reason. This includes plants, people, and animals, and any other physical thing. Today, as in the days of Noah, men tinker with these things for pleasure, profit, and power. In reviewing what was happening on the earth, God saw that the earth was, in the Hebrew, watisahet meaning marred, gone to ruin, meaning the DNA of man was ruined, depraved, or destroyed. And it doesn't mean just corrupted, but the kind of corruption that we will see in the last days when God says he is going to destroy the world by fire. It does not mean to destroy all of creation, but to get rid of those things, including people that no longer have God's DNA, that are no longer in his image. Being in his image is the blood on the doorpost of those who will go through the tribulation. You see, God does not kill his creation just because they erred, for out of his great love for man, he has provided a path of deliverance for us. You know what I'm talking about. What will happen is that he will allow destruction of those who no longer have his image, like the watchers. The pure DNA that God gave them was mixed or compromised by evil. These are those who have traded the truth of God for a lie. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They are shaka, meaning ruined, destroyed. 
Shekah in the Hebrew starts with Shin, which is a very powerful letter. It's the first letter of Shaddai, one of the names of God, and it is spelled Shin Het He. Shin is the picture of teeth, and it means to consume or destroy. Ket means life, and He, pronounced He, H-E-Y, means behold. So behold, life is destroyed, is the meaning of Shekah. The word ruined, or Shekah, is used about six times in this portion. The corrupt DNA seeks to take the kingdom of heaven by force. And this is what Yeshua was talking about in Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent are Hamas, meaning lawless, without the word of God, and full of hatred against God. Instead of being humble and submissive to God's ways, beings with this DNA want to be like God or greater than God. They want to be like God without submitting to God, so they try to take heaven by force. And this is the same thing that was playing out with the evil angels and the women before the flood. Genesis 6.13, God said to Noah, The end of all living things has come before me, for because of them the earth is filled with violence. I will destroy, shakah, them along with the earth. God was saying that he would ruin those who had ruined the earth by mocking his commandments. Just so we don't take this out of context, God is not out to kill people over sin, for he is the deliverer from sin. What we have to understand is at the time of the flood, man was ruined to the point that if time had been allowed to continue, all flesh would have been ruined and he would not have a bride left. He was actually delivering, doing a saving act by allowing to be ruined those who were not redeemable, who had already passed the point of no return, And he said it again about the last days in Matthew 24, verse 22. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Well, let's change a little bit now and talk about exactly what happened for God to see all of those in the world but Noah to be irredeemable. The Bible's got a lot to say about that. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, it is known as being debased or reprobate. As an additional witness, we go outside what the Bible committee put in your Bible to the book of Jubilees, chapter 7, verse 21. Hear it now. For owing to those three things came the flood upon the earth, namely, owing to the fornication wherein the watchers against the Torah of their ordinances went a-whoring after the daughters of men and took themselves wives of all they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanness. You see, the angels were to watch men and help men, but not to engage in cross-species compilation. These wicked angels lusted and went after the daughters of men and took themselves women that they chose, making the beginning of uncleanness. And as a result of their wickedness, giants were born and walked the earth. There were three generations of giants. The great giants, a second generation of giants slightly smaller, and a third generation slightly smaller than the second generation. Verses 22 through 25 of Jubilees, chapter 7. And they begat sons of Nephidim, the first generation, and they were all unlike, and they devoured one another, and the giant slew the Nephil, the second generation, and the Nephil slew the Elio, third generation, and the Elio, mankind, and one man another. They couldn't get enough to eat. It was a total indulgent society of huge giants, some up to 400 feet tall. Because of their appetites, they began cannibalizing one another. 
And this is why one of the first Noahide laws after the flood was the prohibition against eating blood. What we eat has been limited by God and has to be kosher where the blood is drained from the flesh. Don't take any blood into your bodies because the blood is the life of the flesh. And in Jubilees, uh, where we were reading, verse 23, it says, And everyone sold himself to work iniquity and to shed much blood, and the earth was filled with iniquity. And after this they sinned against the beast and the birds and all that moves and walks on the earth, and much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. And Yahweh destroyed everything from off the face of the earth because of the wickedness of their deeds and because of the blood which they had shed in the midst of the earth. God destroyed everything. You see, mankind was modifying and changing even the way that God had created animals. We move on to verse 24 and 25. And every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually, and Yahweh destroyed everything from off the face of the earth because of the wickedness of their deeds and because of the blood which they had shed in the midst of the earth. God destroyed everything. Now we know that through the DNA of Ham's wife, through her children, giants appeared after the flood. This is not a myth or a story. These giants were real because many of their skeletons have been unearthed in excavations both overseas and in the United States. What has been excavated thus far are the smaller giants generally around 36 feet tall. According to the DNA taken from the excavated skeletons, all of these came from the four sons of Ham. They were... Canaan, the infamous Sodom and Gomorrah people, Cush, the peoples of southern Arabia and Ethiopia, Put, which is North Africa, mostly Libya, and Mitzurim, which is the Egyptians, the Philistines, and the Sumerians. A common trait among those excavated is that they all had six fingers and six toes. I'm not going to go into detail about them, but brought them up just to let you know that the story of the giants is not a fable. There's further evidence because in 2002 in Afghanistan, U.S. soldiers claim to have killed a guy in a cave that was cannibalistic with red hair and a beard, six fingers, six toes, and two rows of teeth that was 12 to 15 feet tall. The story was buried by the U.S. State Department despite there being other such sightings and the fact that Afghan soldiers collaborated that there were giants living in caves in remote regions. Because the truth would disrupt the evolution story in the Darwinian model, it's been suppressed. So God told Noah to build an ark and cover it with pitch both inside and out. Now, just a small thing here, but pitch is made from the bark of trees and leaves of plants. The Indians in America made pitch to keep their canoes from seeking. Another interesting fact is the most stable of all the freighter ships made today that can handle the big waves of the ocean follow a formula of the width being one-sixth of the length, and that is exactly the formula God used when he gave Noah the blueprints for the ark. 75 feet wide, 450 feet long, and 45 feet tall. The height of 45 was exactly one-tenth of its length, another part of the formula. Now let me give you just a couple of things the Bible historians have determined from Scripture. The ark was a floating greenhouse that produced food for Adam and the animals to eat. God ordered Noah that in addition to two of every species, he was to bring seven of every clean animal and bird. This was before the Torah was written, so it proves that clean and unclean and the Torah was known to man and followed by the righteous all the way back to the story of the flood. Kosher instructions of God are not something Jewish. 
Now, you see, Adam lived until the time that Noah's father was about 45 years old, so we can see how the Torah was passed orally down from Adam to the time of Noah. In addition to Enoch and Methuselah still living when Noah was building the ark, Noah had direct access to the oral Torah being passed down to him. They were in the ark seven days after God shut the door before it started to rain. You know, they probably got impatient. Have you ever wondered when God told you something why it didn't happen right away and you begin to doubt that it was going to come to pass? Well, Noah and Methuselah witnessed for God and warned people to turn from their sin for 120 years, as I said before, without one convert. So you know they felt a little silly and at times would have doubted what God said. Today, we teach the consequences of sin to our nation, but no one listens. But as in Noah's day, in God's time, the consequences will come about. We may sound silly to the world and they may blow us off, but God's word and God's prophecies will prevail. Genesis gives us the exact day and the month that God began to cleanse the earth from sin through the flood. It was the 17th day of the second month of Moses' 600th year. Genesis 7, verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. Now remember, the Torah is an outline of how we are to live, but there are many sources of information that reveal the details of how we are to live outside of the Torah. Jubilees is one of those sources. In Jubilees 3 verse 17 it says, And after the completion of seven years, which he had completed there, seven years exactly, and in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the serpent came and approached the woman, and the serpent said to the woman, Has Yahweh commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So here's the point. The water began gushing from the earth, and it started raining to flood the earth and purge it from sin. On the exact same day, sin entered the world, the seventeenth day of the second month. Before the flood, men and animals cohabitated and even communicated because the animals understood the name that Adam gave them. So it was no surprise to Eve when the serpent spoke to her. In the ark, the animals actually presented themselves to Noah according to some of the dialogue of the rabbis. After the flood, the animals became skittish of men because they were hunted more and more. Now, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and the water covered the tallest mountain on earth by 22 and a half feet. The height of the mountains differs today because of the shifting tectonic plates, but the depth of the water above sea level in the same type of flood today would be 29,050 feet and a half. It rained for 40 days, and then in Genesis 7, verse 24, it says, The water held power over the earth for another 150 days. They did not exit the ark until the first month of the 601st year of Noah. A wind came and dried up and pushed back the waters. And we know that that happened in the exodus at the Red Sea. It happened in Genesis 1 verse 1. Bible scholars liken this to the wind from the nostrils of God performing these things. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ariat. When a date is given to us in the Holy Word, it's calling our attention to something. Here it is calling attention to the fact that the ark landed during the holy days at the time of Sukkot. Sukkot is a week-long celebration about our living in temporary dwellings, God providing for us. Noah removed the top off the ark and all began to leave the ark. But before that, Noah sent out a raven that went back and forth until the waters had dried up from the earth. Then Noah sent out a dove, and the dove, having found no place to light, returned. 
He waited seven days and sent the dove out again, and it returned with a fresh olive leaf in her mouth. The symbol of the olive tree is Israel. The future tribes of Israel were in Noah's loins and would come through his son Shem. He waited another seven days, and he sent the dove out again, and it never returned. Now Noah knew that the earth was drying up, and that was on the first day of the first month, which is Aviv, the new year. So in Jubilees chapter 6, verse 11, it says, On this account he spoke to you that you should make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath, and that you should sprinkle blood upon them because of all the words of the covenant which Yahweh made with them forever. And this testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beast or birds or cattle during all the days of the earth. And the man who eats the blood of beast or of cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth, he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land. And do you command the children of Israel to eat no blood so that their names and their seed may be before Yahweh, our sovereign ruler, continually? Folks, it's through the transference of blood that we take on other contaminants. And it says in Jubilees, And for this Torah there is no limit of days, for it is forever. They shall observe it throughout their generations, so that they may continue supplicating on your behalf with blood before the altar every day, and at the time of morning and evening they shall seek forgiveness on your behalf perpetually before Yahweh, that they may keep it and not be rooted out. Right here, folks, is the establishment of the evening and the morning sacrifices. We'll continue reading in Jubilees. And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not be again a flood on the earth. He set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it in all the days of the earth. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should celebrate the Feast of Weeks, he's talking about Shavuot, in this month, once a year, to renew the covenant every year. God established the Rainbow Covenant, and later on with Shavuot, or Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Noah came out of the ark just in time to build an altar, collect firewood, and make an offering to Hashem by Shavuot. Isn't it amazing that God correlated events hundreds of years before their sister events occurred? Why do people want to doubt God's word when it's so accurate? Shavuot is that festival where God renews covenant with man and we see it in Noah's day. We see Isaac was born as a child of promise on Shavuot and the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai. Later, of course, the disciples were gathered, unified in, in one accord on Mount Zion in the upper room when the Spirit of God descended like flames of fire and they each heard voices in their native language. It seems like it always happens on a mountain. The ark came to rest on a mountain, the Ten Commandments were given on a mountain, and the upper room was on the top of a mountain. And we know from Exodus 16:11 and Jubilee 6 that this was on the new moon on the third month, just a few days from Shavuot. God ordered Noah and the birds and the animals from the ark, and he gave them the same commandments as he did in the first of creation. Genesis 8, 17. Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. All right, so let's talk now and wind up with the Tower of Babel. In the setting of chapter 11, the families of the sons of Noah traveled from the east where the ark came to rest following the Araxis River because it's one of the most fertile areas in the Middle East. This has a bearing on the story of Noah declaring a curse on his son Ham, the consequences that carry forth to the Tower of Babel. Noah became a farmer and planted a vineyard. 
The grapes made excellent but potent wine because of the fertile land and the lack of oxygen resulting from the flood. Noah drank some of the potent wine and got drunk and naked in his tent. Ham viewed his father's nakedness while Shem and Jabbath backed into the tent so that they would not see their father's nakedness. Thus, the curse on Ham. Later, the families continued to migrate and settle in the land of Shinar, which is Babylon. They were no doubt traumatized by what they went through in the flood in which the canopy of water over the earth fell with such great intensity. They began to think and calculated that a flood would come every 656 years. They wanted to prevent it happening again, so they wanted to make supports for the sky to get ready for the next flood cycle. If it sounds strangely like the Green New Deal environmental movement, it's not by accident. But there were two problems with their thinking. It was only a hundred years after the flood, and using their rationale, it would be 1,500 years before another one. Secondly, they ignored God's promise not to flood the whole earth again by fixing the rainbow in the sky. Nimrod, the grandson of Noah's son, Ham, was the first to become a mighty man on the earth, and his name means, We Shall Rebel. The descendants of Noah began to speak harsh words about God concerning the flood and decided to defy the Creator by building a great tower to symbolize their own power. It is not known as to whether they were trying to bring the gods down to earth to help them or if they wanted to ascend to become like gods. In either case, they wanted to be in control and God didn't like it. With one stroke, God by confusing their language into 70 different languages, divided the world into 70 nations. Out of the group that began building the Tower of Babel, God called a man named Abram, later changed to Abraham, from the land of the Chaldeans. Because Abraham listened to and obeyed God, he became a Hebrew, meaning one who has crossed over from death to life, and God blessed him to be the father of many nations. God said in Genesis 11 verse 7, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Who was he talking to? He was speaking to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him. Jasher 9 verse 32 says, And God said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him, to those who were near to him, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto them. So what happened to the tower? Jasher 9 verse 38 gives us that answer. And as to the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one-third part of it, and a fire also descended from heaven and burned another third, and the other third is left to this day, and it is of that part which was aloft, and its circumference is three days' walk. Now let's get to the message here. Mankind failed in the dispensation of human government, and political evidence is that in our day, man is still failing to properly, ethically, and morally govern. The environmentalists of today have created an idol, and we now have a cult executing power in our nation to control nature. Man is once again implementing humanist laws to replace God's laws. God tested man to see if he would implement and follow human laws that were based on his laws. The power of human law is only successful if it is based on God's instructions. Man has failed again, disregarding God's laws to follow their own demented minds. It's happening all over again. It's easy to see where that's going. Total immorality, complete and total debasement, a reprobate mind is where our country is headed. As in the days of Noah, God will not let this continue. Destruction directly lies ahead. 
destruction will be the correction because this is God's world created to be his dwelling place with man. He will not live in a place filled with evil. Right now, only 5% of Americans can name even two of the Ten Commandments. King David said in Psalm 119 verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. David memorized the word so that he could walk it out knowing about the commandments and knowing the commandments are two different things. America has forgotten the God of the Bible and for that reason it will not survive as the land of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The commandments are covenants that must be kept if we're going to prosper. Don't keep them and death ensues, the death of nations, communities, states, and individuals. God is not first in the heart of Americans. There are 210 million Americans that claim to be Christian. No politician would go against 210 million godly people united in his cause and standing on his commandments. The truth is there are few who will stand with God. Our country has a lot of idols that come before God. Money, power, environment, racism, selfish ambitions, and more are our gods. The results of serving these gods are abortion, critical race theory, hatred, murder, theft, a failing economy, the end of the family unit, suffering children, sexual sin, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, fornication, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, outbursts of wrath, dissensions, heresies, envy, and revelries. And I could go on. If there were 210 million Christians gathered together on Saturday the Sabbath demanding their pastors teach them the Torah, these things would not be. Folks, God's commandments are binding and absolute. They are not recommendations. They are instructions to live by and life and death hangs in the balance, yours and our country's. Now let's get to the bottom of it. The problem lies in the hearts of the people. People don't need to be taught myths and fables. They need to have God's commandments written on their hearts so they can walk them out. The truth is the church is neutered. The church talks the talk but will not walk the walk. God's people are few, they're weak, they're divided, and they've lost their way in Satan's totalitarian state rules. God sees all this, but there will be no flood. There will be a purifying, cleansing fire that will cleanse the world. The Tower of Babel came down quickly and easily, and the fire that consumes all iniquity will burn intensely. Teshuva, America, Teshuva, or it's game over. This is Pastor Frank Smith. When the ark landed, Noah immediately built an altar and made sacrifices to God. Noah honored God, but his descendants went from honoring God to rebelling against God in Babylon with a tower. The tower was destroyed, and God changed their language, dividing them and dispersing them. God will not let evil band together for long and destroy his bride. That lesson should have been learned. Yet today, despite all the technology and knowledge we have gained, we are committing the same transgressions all over again. Peace on earth and eternal life is to be gained or lost right now. Submit to God and let him change your life. Shalom.